Towards the middle of World War II, Japanese doctrine was writing checks that Japanese industry could not cash. Now, Japan was always an adherent of maneuver warfare, and in the 1930s, they were adherents of maneuver mechanized warfare. And they undertook some very daring operations with independent mechanized brigades and the like. But they never really went all in on the division scale until after seeing the success that Germany had in 1939-1940. Japanese doctrineers looked at this and said, you know, these are a good idea. We need to make some armored divisions of our own. So they created four of them. Three fought in China and one against the Americans in the Pacific Theater. Now, of course, it's a lot easier to say we are going to create an armored division than it is to actually create an armored division. And this is where the industrial limitations of Japan came in. They only had so much metal, only had so much manufacturing capacity, and most of it ended up going on tanks, and a lot less on tank destroyers or self-propelled guns. But one of the designs that they looked at from Germany was that of the Grill, the 15 centimeter self-propelled gun. And the Japanese realized realistically enough that, well, if we're going to have this doctrine that has mobile mechanized units, they need mobile mechanized artillery as well. So they developed this vehicle here. It is a Type 4 Ho-Ro. Forgive my Japanese pronunciation. It's as best as you're going to get an Irish accent in California to do. This particular vehicle is the only survivor because the Japanese, as I say, didn't make very many in the first place. And the few that they did make, we had this habit of blowing up. It is to be found at the American Heritage Museum in Hudson, Massachusetts. So you land at Boston, you go west, you need about an hour to get you close enough. It's actually owned by the US Marine Corps. It is on loan. But regardless, it is one of the few self-propelled gun modifications of a Japanese tank that we can find. So as we go around, let's see what's a little bit unusual about the way the Japanese did. One of the problems of scripting for an inside hatch on a Japanese vehicle is that there's actually not a heck of a lot of the details available to research ahead of time. So we are going to embark upon a voyage of discovery as we walk around the vehicle and see just what it is that we can learn. Again, I always harp on, this is why it's a great idea to go to a museum if you want to learn about a tank, because there's all so much out there that you can't read. The basic chassis is of the Type 97 tank that she had, medium tank. And compared to, let's say, the Honey modification, the tank destroyer, they've done slightly more reconfiguration. So for example, you don't see the driver's bulge on the right-hand side as you would on a Honey. Instead, you just have a superstructure on top of a hull, period. The armor at the front, well, it is metal. And I will tell you in a moment that it is about 15 millimeters thick. But I do note that there's actually a curve. They've rolled it at the bottom or pressed it or however they've uh, managed to make the curve. But most of it, as you can see, is bolted or riveted. Not exactly high-tech welding. Other features on here, well, you can see that they've added a little bit of armor specifically onto the final drives. You can see you know, the armor has been broken away on that side. It's still perfectly relatively intact. On the left, a single towing pintle on the front here. I sadly don't see where the uh, chrysanthemum would have gone. One of the other problems with this vehicle, and uh, it gets, I'm afraid to say, a little bit worse for some of the uh, ones owned by the Army, is that they haven't been restored. At least this one has been preserved in a reasonable state. We cannot get the hatches open. Uh, it's probably going to take a lot of time with penetrating oil, crowbars, and we don't have time to do it. So all we can do is merely speculate, and maybe we'll have a look on the inside to see what is behind these hatches. But very obviously, you're going to have your steering system in here, your transmission most likely, uh, with access ports for those components. So that done, now it's time to go to the side, and arguably one of the more interesting parts of the vehicle.
Before getting into the suspension, I'm going to start off right quick with the upper hull, the superstructure. And a quick estimate is yeah, about three centimeters. Looks a little bit less, but I guess it's supposed to be three. Now, you'll note that we have bolts here versus rivets here. Now, your reason for that is going to be visible on the inside. The rivets are what holds the body of the vehicle together. The bolts, however, are mounting points for the cannon. Coming down, we're going to see the track. The track is about as basic as World War II track can get. It is dead, single pin, cast track. No rubber. And in fairness, there's two reasons for this. One, jungles kind of eat rubber anyway. Uh, it's not a great environment for rubber. And secondly, well, most of the places that this tank was going to operate didn't exactly have modern western style infrastructure with tarmac adams roads and so on so you weren't really losing very much in terms of grip by not using rubber anyway but for the sake of the measurements it's about 33 and a half centimeters wide with a pitch of seems to be about 12 and a half centimeters the two measurements were actually different but it's an old track, it's probably stretched over the years. Now to actually pull the track apart, it took a little bit of uh, looking because of all the dirt, but what is holding it in are little cutter pins, which are hammered up from the inside. And then the, the pins are split and they will curl out at the top. So if what you want to do is get the pin out to break track, there's a hole on this side, not on the front. You reach in with a tool, you pinch the pin together, force it down, and eventually it'll come out long enough that you can grab the potter, potter pin and pull it all the way out. And I have a feeling that is one of those things that is much more easily done on a factory test track when it is clean than in the field after a whole bunch of uh, operations and mud and everything else that gets in there. So I don't know, maybe, maybe it's at the point that, well, if you're gonna be breaking track you're writing off the link anyway, just get a, an oxyacetylene torch, break it that way. That might be excessive, but I can honestly see troops in the field resorting to such measures because the supposedly uh, official way of getting things done isn't going to work. But let's move on now and talk about the suspension. So as I'm down here, I was going to start off with the unique suspension, but I'm looking forward at the sprocket wheel. And it seems to me that the tooth ring cannot be detached for maintenance or replacement. It looks like you have to pull off the entire sprocket wheel if your sprockets, uh, your teeth, have worn down too much. Because if you look at, let's say, an American vehicle or a German vehicle, there are bolts holding the ring to the rest of the wheel. And it looks like they've riveted the thing in and I can't imagine that they're easy punch out rivets because that would be a silly thing to put on the front of a sprocket wheel that obviously has so much effort and torque going behind it or maybe they did because they were silly I don't know but it's just an observation I'm making as I'm there uh, the return rollers there's three of them one of them is only a half width that's not particularly unusual it saves a little bit of the rubber if nothing else and then you come down to the unique bell crank suspension that was developed by an engineer by the name of Tomio Hara. Uh, again, forgive my Japanese pronunciation. And it had a couple of good features and a couple of quirks. Now, some of the good features about this. A, it's an external bogey system, so it takes up no room inside the tank. B, it is very easy to make. It's just coil springs and wheels and pivot points. See, compared to a lot of the other external bogey systems that were running around in the mid-1930s, especially those that used leaf springs, you get a lot of range of motion out of uh, this system. Downsides, it rocks a lot. There's no dampening, really. Once this thing starts oscillating, it'll keep oscillating until eventually the springs stop oscillating. Now, the original suspension design was developed for the Type 95 light tank, the Hago, which of course only has four pairs of road wheels per side. We have an extra pair uh, on the ends for the Type 97. So what they've done is 
instead of trying to extend the bogey, they have simply added an extra arm on the end with a bit of a point and an extra spring that simply attaches to the original bogey system that was there. So the coil spring for this, very easy. You can see how as this uh, wheel comes up and back, it stretches this spring forward, which of course is going to spring back to give you your suspension effect. It gets a little bit more complicated when you get to the main bogeys. So the wheels here are on their own unsprung rotating bogey. So if the undulations aren't too large, all that's gonna happen is that the bogey itself will remain generally still, and these two wheels will pivot around the pivot point. Now, if you get to a bump which is large enough that both wheels at the same time are gonna be forced up, what will happen is this entire bogey is gonna pivot around this fulcrum here, which as you can see is mounted to a couple of rods. It will push forward. Again, inside here, behind this protective covering, are more coil springs very similar to the ones here so as this pushes up because of the bump it stretches the coil spring and it uh, basically will allow pressure or force to be pulled back to push the suspension unit back down again it's a lot more complicated to explain than it actually is and if you ever see an animation of this thing going uh, even then, you're looking at it, trying to figure out exactly where the point of anchor is on the two springs. Because what you will notice is that these two rods here are vertical. And if you look on the two rods at the aft end of the bogey system, they're horizontal. So they actually mesh past each other. Inside, there is, I believe, four coil springs in total. Look it up it's much easier than my explaining it. And of course, when we can't unbolt these here in the museum to show you ourselves, but that's how it works. So again, this is the first time we've looked in detail at a Japanese tank, and you're going to see this suspension type pop up more than once as we continue a Japanese series. Moving further back on the engine deck, a little bit of overhead protection for the air intakes. Underneath is a Mitsubishi Type 100 V12. Tanks at about 170 horsepower. It is an air-cooled diesel. And the Japan, of course, used diesel engines a lot uh, for its tanks. There are a couple of reasons for it. Suffice to say, it wasn't just that they were supremely advanced or anything ahead of the time. It was more a matter of desperation. This was the fuel that they could use. And in fairness, it was quite efficient. Regardless of all the other advantages of diesel engines that we know today, they, they didn't really exist to the same extent back in World War II era. So anyway. Diesel engine underneath, fantastic, go Japan. On to the uh, sponsons. You're gonna see evidence here of where there was a stowage box. Come back, you have some armor protection, uh, probably for brush, but I guess it'll work for bullets as well. The exhaust will come at the side, make a left turn, the muffler will be mounted here, and then the exhaust will come at the back. Now, something I've noticed as we're walking around is if you have a look at the way these coils are attached to the swing arms, you would think that what they've done is they've made the bogies in such a manner that they're symmetrical so you can take the back left bogey and use it to replace the front right or vice versa. They have done that, but be a little bit cautious. You'll see that the coil springs are vertical on the rear mounts and horizontal on the forward mounts. And that's the same for all four positions, horizontal at the front, vertical at the back. I can see absolutely no logical reason for doing this. But on the other hand, I don't see a particular disadvantage either. I would have just thought that if it was entirely symmetrical, they would have the vertical at the back on the left and at the front on the left. That's simply you rotate the entire bogey 180. They didn't do that, but because of the way these are held on with large bolts, disconnecting the coil spring and just moving it around without changing the rotation doesn't do any harm. I just thought it was an interesting feature of note for people who like to make models. Now I'm gonna to have to find myself another Type 97 to actually figure out what is behind here. I can see the radiator is mounted on the whole roof, goes all the way forward on the stowage. We can't get this open, it's frozen in place. I have to assume this is for access for oil and other fluids, whilst 
perhaps we're talking fuel behind these things. Again, I haven't seen a manual for these things. It's certainly not in a language that I understand. So I'm going to keep hunting around to see if I can find another vehicle that I can open up a little better. And we will continue our voyage of discovery in another video, which is great because that means you got to keep coming back and watching our videos. Track tension, a little bit different. So you can see there is a screwed ratchet here with a little handle that if you have to loosen the track tension, it looks like you push down on the handle, it lifts up the lock and everything unscrews. Now, the interesting thing here I see, well, there's two interesting things, in fact. One is that you're attempting to tension the track on a tank with what is realistically a fairly small nut. If you compare the size of this nut head on this vehicle compared to, let's say, a Sherman, which has a much, much bigger wrench, gives you much more torque and leverage, and it's less likely to twist. Uh, but apparently, because it is not twisted, it was still good enough. Maybe it's because this is just a fairly loosely tensioned track anyway. Uh, the other thing I'll notice is that on both this side and on the far side, the locking lug is missing or retracted. The only thing holding the tension on the track right now appears to be the rust which I guess is another argument that there isn't actually all that much tension on the track. Uh, last thing I'll note is that unlike at the front, where there is a single towing eye, there are twin at the back. So presumably if you had to tow something, you'd be using an A-frame. You'd be using two mounts at the back, connecting to the single one at the front. So that said, let's look at the right-hand side. As you come around the right-hand side, the only notable difference I can see is in front of the muffler on the right-hand side is no stowage bin. It is mounting points for tools. Otherwise, it seems to be fairly identical. Now, there is a phrase back in Ireland that was, well, if you saw a vehicle or a person or anything that was a little bit battered, you might say it's been through the wars. Well, this vehicle quite literally has been through the wars and it shows it. However, I shall now risk life, limb, rust, tetanus, and asbestos, because the Japanese were heavy users of asbestos as installation in their vehicles in World War II, by climbing into the crew compartment and having a quick look at the armament and what's left of the driver's position. The driver's hull, well, there's a couple more levers and controls in here than I was expecting even with the actual panels completely gone. But some of them I think are relatively easy to figure out. For example, this would appear to be your transmission, your gear stick, as it is mounted basically straight into the transmission. This appears to be a dipstick for the transmission levels. I would estimate this is a brake for the prop shaft. Looking at the way these connectors come in to the two sides, I think this is a main service brake for applying uh, either for parking or just you want to get both uh, brakes operating at the same time. Whereas they connect, it seems, to these handles here, the inner handles, which also appear to be brakes, except one brake per track. So that brings us to the last question then as to what are these ones for on the outside? Now, again, I am going to bear this in mind for the next time I look at a Type 97 hull that might be perhaps in a better condition or one that happens to have a manual with it. Uh, but I am suspecting that there may be individual steering clutches. I mean, the, the main clutch you can see comes back into here and that makes some sense. Uh, but these two in conjunction with the two brakes, maybe it is possible you're supposed to grab both handles at the same time when you're steering. So perhaps if you just want a shallow turn, you pull the one handle. And if you want a sharp turn, you gotta pull both handles at the same time to apply both the clutch to release the power and the brake to stop the track. It'll be interesting to find out. Oh, the last thing appears to be a, a fixed throttle or a hand throttle on the right hand side. Uh, outside of that, uh, you can see the structure which is holding the vehicle together. Uh, it looks like the floor is held on partly by rivets here and then there are little individual L uh, angle plates. So I'm sure there's a technical term for them, not being a mechanical engineer, I don't actually know that term. 
not the most sturdily built vehicle, all things considered. And of course, rivets are just plain inefficient for weight. Well, there's not much else in the front, so I'm gonna now turn and look at this contraption that has been befuddling me for a few minutes at the rear. Now, I don't think I've seen anything like this before. Uh, it almost looks like a miniature engine, but as near as I can tell, what it actually is, is it's the accelerator. So I'm looking at 12 of these fittings, which are solid metal and they appear to be fuel uh, because it meant it's a diesel engine and you don't use spark plugs in the thing. There are the linkages which you would associate with uh, accelerators, yet it is obviously way too small to be an engine. Uh, so what it seems to me is the case, and again, this is me speculating on the basis of past knowledge, is that there simply wasn't room in the engine compartment for the engine and the fuel system at the same time. So the fuel gets pumped in, starts to get distributed for the 12 cylinders here in the crew compartment, and then the 12 cylinders each get the fuel feeds all the way from the front of the vehicle to the engine bay at the back, which I guess it gets the job done. And then I could be entirely wrong. This could be personal speculation that is not even close, but uh, I defy many other people who aren't engineers to sit inside a vehicle, look at something and go, well, what the hell did this do? And come up with a better answer. So that is my guess for now. And yet again, tune in later for another Type 97 based vehicle. Now we'll see if we can find a better answer. Right, the gunner's position on the left hand side. The right hand side seems to be the commander, but it doesn't have anything there, at least not that's left. And it is simple. Now, when you look at a whole row, at least for me, it reminds me a lot of the Bishop sub gun, the British made on the Valentine, with a lot of the same limitations. So it's basically big, top heavy looking with limited elevation and traverse. The traverse on this is about 10 degrees to the side and all of 20 degrees in elevation, which is the same as a tank, uh, same as modern tank at least. And not really adequate, you would think, for most indirect fire missions. Yet, as you're sitting here looking at the way this vehicle is laid out, I don't think this actually could do indirect fire missions. It seems to me that this is literally a self-propelled gun not a self-propelled howitzer or similar. The only sighting system I can see is the direct sight on the left-hand side. You don't have the elevation to do indirect unless you went on a ramp. And even if you did have the ability to put it on a ramp, I have no idea where you would put a quadrant or a level or anything else to aim this thing indirectly. In addition, not only do I not see anything for indirect fire on the gunner's side, I don't see anything on the commander's side either. There's a little mounting for something uh, just behind the viewport on the right-hand side, but it is fixed in place. So I don't think the commander would have any indirect capability either. I mean, this seems to be almost an assault gun more than anything else, which kind of kills the point of your self-propelled artillery unit in a mechanized division because you already have tanks to do the sort of the direct fire roll. But that's what we have. Uh, elevation and traverse is very simple uh, with the use of these hand wheels. You can see the mounting points. It was indeed for the internal structure here as well as uh, on the front. So those were the bolts that I mentioned on the outside. We have two uh, drop down rods here, extensible. Uh, these are obviously your travel locks for when you're bouncing around cross country at whatever speed you can bounce around at. In this, it holds the gun in position. And then you get to the gun itself, the Type 38, which in the Japanese nomenclature system is related to the gear of the reign of the emperor. So 38 in this context means 1905. And then you basically start from zero again when the next emperor shows up in the 1930s. As we recall it was the 1930s as a backtrack from type 40, type zero. You get the idea. Type, you, as long as the guy is alive, you keep adding numbers and then the next emperor shows up and you start from one again. Anyway, it was made by Krupp initially. Uh, it was a 1905 gun and 
Yeah, it was okay for pre-World War I standards with your interrupted screw breech and your range of about six to seven kilometers. Uh, but by World War II standards, the thing is basically obsolete. It'd be withdrawn from frontline service with the Japanese artillery, yet somehow they decided it would be a brilliant thing to put onto the few self-propelled guns that they were going to use. Now, when this was towed artillery, it had a train of eight horses to haul it around. And maybe part of the reason it was declared obsolete it was just too damn big and heavy to use horses. And it wasn't much of a problem if you put it onto a mechanized vehicle. And I guess they had the guns hanging around, they had the ammunition hanging around, and the Japanese aren't getting too picky at this point in the war, 1944. But uh, that's what you have on this vehicle. And so that's what you see. Uh, oh, I should say that the guns were originally designed by Krupp, but after the first few later ones were built in Japan. Being a large 15 centimeter round, you can imagine there isn't a hell of a lot of room for them. So there might have been stowage for a few pieces inside, but I suspect uh, that uh, there is a fair bit of stowage in the big bin, which is on top of the radiator on the engine deck as well, simply so that you didn't have... Uh, too many supporting vehicles driving around hauling around munition just for the gun. So that's pretty much it. Uh, time to close up. All in all, I don't know if I can say great things about this vehicle. Yeah, it would have an effect on somebody if you came around the corner and you saw yourself facing down a 15 centimeter gun in the direct fire roll, if you were that unfortunate. However, the vehicle was designed to be self-propelled artillery for a mechanized unit. It doesn't do that job. So I'm afraid to say, Japan, nice try, interesting technological feature, bad move. Anyway, hope you found the tour interesting and informative. So from the American Heritage Museum, take care and I'll talk to you on the next one.